This is Charles Clinton. I'm one of the surgeons at South Falls. Today we've got a fairly simple case, which is a soft tissue sarcoma on the lateral thorax of a nine-year-old cattle dog. Um, so the mass is quite movable uh, uh, in the skin, which means that the margins that we're going to have to get are um, the deep margin is not going to be as critical. So what I'm doing is I'm drawing a circle around the palpable tumor right here. And then uh, I'm going to go up <clears throat> about two centimeters in all directions. And so that's out here and out here. And um, then I'm going to turn that into an ellipse like this. Now the the two centimeters in all directions is honestly kind of arbitrary. And I know that we were all taught in vet school that you need to go two to three centimeters in all directions, every malignant cancer, but it actually is um, a little bit more variable than that. And if I've got a well circumscribed tumor like this, um, I don't think that I need to go as wide as, for example, with a injection site sarcoma in a cat, I need to go five centimeters in all directions. Um, and if it's a, a low, you know, lower intermediate grade soft tissue sarcoma in the extremity of a dog, um, then, um, you know, even half a centimeter or a centimeter is enough. And basically what we need to do is go one cell layer beyond cancer in all directions. And so what we're doing is we're trying to guess how long microscopic or how far microscopic cancer cells exist beyond the visible tumor. And so if I have something that, that looks well circumscribed, my assumption is that we're not gonna have microscopic cancer extending very far away from the tumor. Whereas if I have something that's very nebulous um, and or is something that historically be behaves more aggressively, like an injection site sarcoma in a cat, I'm gonna have to go wider. And so cats are like five centimeters in all directions with injection site sarcomas um, and well circumscribed soft tissue sarcomas on the chest wall of a dog, I'm more happy to go with about two centimeter margins. Now this was not graded before we went in. And so we just know that it's a soft tissue sarcoma based on cytology. And so I don't know whether it's a grade one, two and, or a grade three, but grossly it looks like a lower and immediate grade soft tissue sarcoma. Um, so I'm gonna make my incision. I'm going to go all the way down to the chest wall, but not through the chest wall because the mass is movable. And I've got plenty of, of extra skin to work with in this area, so I'm not worried about my ability to close this thing. So I can be fairly um, liberal with my excision. So as always, if you're not subscribed to our channel, please subscribe and also turn on notifications. Can you retract on that for me, please? Turn on notifications so that in the future, when we live stream surgery, you'll get a notification on your phone. We have the, the chat running right now, so if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to ask them. Having an assistant retracting on the skin while we're incising is really helpful. Going down through the cutaneous chunk eye muscle right here. I don't think I'll go all the way through latissimus dorsi, but I'll just see uh, once I make my skin incision and I see how mobile the mass is, I'll decide whether I need to go another muscle layer down or not. Right, so this is very freely movable. Um, you can see here few blood vessels there. And so if I can, if I can remove like three centimeters of fat underneath the tumor, again, I'm going to assume that it's not going to extend beyond that. So I'm just going down to latissimus dorsi muscle, but not through it. Can I get some mepipicane, please? Mepipicane, yeah. And this just looks like a relatively benign, you know, non-aggressive tumor to me, just based on how mobile the fat is um, underlying it and how mobile the tumor was. 
uh, in the skin. As we know, the, the biggest predictor for survival with soft tissue sarcomas in dogs is the grade of the tumor, and the metastatic grade is predicted by the grade, and so low and intermediate grade soft tissue sarcomas have a metastatic rate of about 10%, whereas high grade soft tissue sarcomas are about 50%. And we also know that chemotherapy does not prevent recurrence with soft tissue sarcomas. Oh, sorry, it does not prevent um, metastasis with soft tissue sarcomas. Metronomic chemotherapy does uh, prevent recurrence if you have a dirty margin. And so metronomic chemotherapy in one study was shown to be as effective as radiation therapy in preventing recurrence of soft tissue sarcomas. And the metronomic chemotherapy that we're talking about is um, paroxicam and cyclophosphamide. That was described in a publication by Robin uh, Downing, I believe. I'm just injecting all the way around in the skin with mopivacaine. And every blood vessel that I managed to miss with my original surgery, I'm hitting with my needle. <laughs> so that's why it's bleeding. And I'll take some OPDS, please. We took thoracic radiographs on this patient beforehand. And our decision as to whether we're gonna do a biopsy preoperatively depends on whether the owners are willing to do a surgery that would be um, for a worst case scenario tumor. So if say for this did come back a grade three soft tissue sarcomas, sarcoma, would the owners be willing to do a surgery knowing that there's a 50% chance that the tumor would metastasize, and the answer to this is yes, this owner was willing to do that. And also given the fact that this was a fairly benign looking tumor, I was pretty confident that it was not going to be a high grade. So I'm doing a slip knot here, so that's a, a square knot. And I'm just gonna pull up on one of, this, one of the ends and see how it turns into a slip knot. And then you just pull on just the long end till it pulls together. And then I'm gonna lock it off by pulling it apart. And that works much better than a surgeon's knot in my opinion. I have not done a surgeon's knot in probably 20 years. Surgeon's knot is when you do two throws to start with, followed by the um, you know four or five normal throws. All right, so I'll demonstrate that slip knot again. I'm doing kind of an inverted cruciate through the cutaneous trunk eye muscle. And then I'll come up here. So I'll pull that apart so you can see. So doing my regular throws of a square knot like this. So that's the square knot there. Then I pull on one side, flip it into a slip knot, pull down. And then once it's down, then I lock it off by pulling on the other suture. Demonstrate that again. I'll do just a single bite. I'm not gonna do this, the cruciate so you can see <coughs> it work. Right, so square knot, or, or regular square knot thrust. So that's my square knot there. And then I pull on one end, leaving the other end alone, convert it into a slip knot, and just pull down. Not, I'm not pulling on this one at all, just pull down on the long one, and then I lock it off. And then do three more throws on top of that. And the slip knot's a really handy suture to do. It's how I close everything. I don't do surgeon's knots at all. It's a much neater 
way to close and it's better at um, at uh, opposing skin edges when there's tension. So there's our square, our regular square knot, pull on one side, flip it into a slip knot, pull it up, and then lock it off. Yes. And see how I'm going deep to superficial and then superficial to deep. That's the way that I'm burying my knot. So pulling my suture parallel to the incision, one knot or one throw, two throw. That's already flipped itself into a slip knot. So I'll flip it the other way. That tried to lock itself off. So back down, lock it off and then tie it. And I just kind of, when I'm doing sub-Q sutures like this, um, or technically I guess these are in the cutaneous trunk eye, I just kind of split the length of the incision. So I'm, I did one in the middle here, one on each quarter, and then one on each eighth. So first throw, second throw, so that's my square knot that's then gone into a slip. All right, so that's pretty much it. I'm gonna have Chris do the intradermal form. And can I get some 2O PDS? And the, the slip knot takes practice um, because you tend to want to pull on both ends of the suture. I'm just gonna start there. Um, so, you tend to want to pull on both ends, which is going to lock it off prematurely. So I'll demonstrate it one more time. I um, might have to move my camera a little bit. All right, so I've placed my suture. Okay, so first throw, second throw. So that's our square knot, okay? And then I'm just pulling on my long end, flip it into a slip knot. And then all I'm doing is pulling on my long end. I'm not pulling on my short end at all. Pull that down. Once it's tight, then I pull on both and lock it off. I just All right, so I'm going to have Chris, our intern, do a simple continuous in the intradermal layer. And I'm finished, I'll come over to the computer. I think I've got a question or two. Um, and hello from Columbia and another thank you. You're very, very welcome. Um, and so that's pretty much it. I'll let the video run for a minute. So you can watch Chris doing his intradermal, make him nervous, he likes that. Yeah, so our post-op checklist is coming up. So pain relief charted, so we'll use just methadone. Uh, we do want a, a fentanyl patch. So carprofen non -steroidals. we don't need any antibiotics, no other medications, IV fluids, just maintenance, no lab work except to submit the pathology. Um, no other charting requirements. Uh, sedation is fine, and we can use either ACE or uh, uh, Domator or Dextoma or whatever, and then we're going to do rechecks at probably just 14 days, unless there's a problem before then. All right, no worries. And I'm just going to move the camera onto the, the checklist. Can you hold the checklist up? So this is our checklist here. Uh, I think that that will be forward. Uh, let me just zoom out. So this is the checklist that we do for every patient. Um, so up here is the patient information. This is 
checklist that the vets do during consultation. So primary care vet history, uh, diagnosis confirmed, procedure confirmed, blood work discussed, master uh, problem list added. And then on admission, uh, we make sure that we've got the contact information confirmed, that the patient's been fasted, uh, that uh, the admission form has been signed. Um, we have done an estimate and that's been signed and we have potential complications signed by the owner. And then for the anesthetic, um, we uh, confirm whether we need any preoperative imaging in the form of either radiographs or a CT scan. Uh, if indicated, we have to call the owner after or contact the owner after the imaging. Once again, we confirm the side and the procedure. We uh, confirm the approach. Uh, the uh, nurse who's doing the clip and positioning confirms that with the surgeon to make sure that we are on the same page. We administer our pre-op antibiotics unless we're doing a culture and surgery. And then before we go into surgery, somebody comes in and checks the an anesthetic machine, makes sure that all the hoses are connected and the pop-off valve is open and that there's isoflurane in the machine. And then in surgery, we do our other checklist. Hold on, I'll just uh, pull that off there. So this is our operating room checklist here. Um, and so ground plate connected, confirm side and procedure again, confirm any instruments that we're gonna require, do we want photographs taken, discuss potential uh, complications, and then assess the risk of blood loss. And then the nurses calculate the blood volume based on a formula which is 8% of body weight is the blood volume. And then when we're finished with surgery, you come back in uh, with our end of surgery checklist, which is charting of pain relief, discuss whether we're gonna do non-steroidals, are we gonna do antibiotics, any other medications, IV fluids, any other lab work required, discuss any other charting requirements, is there sedation approved, and then what rechecks do we need, seven, 14 days, or eight weeks, and any other notes that we might have here. Also, we have a diagram here that we, if I remember, um, we draw where we want the clip done, and this is done in the consultation room with the owner present so they know what to expect. Sorry, did you have a question for me, Jeff? Yeah, I'm just watching the next And then we'll come back and see how Chris is doing on the incision. Doing a great job. I'll just zoom in on him a little bit so you can watch him shaking. All right, so just a very nice intradermal suture pattern. And that is pretty much it. So I'm going to stop the live stream now. Just come over and check the... Um, so... Uh, question is, how long would we typically give non-steroidals for this type of procedure? Usually I do about four days, something like that, even up to a week. This dog was already on uh, Carprof, and I think for, was it on for um, arthritis pre-existing, Jess? Yeah. Um, so he's already been on Carprof in any way. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. Um, if you have any questions, you can certainly post them uh, on the comment section below the video. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so that you know when we're going to be live streaming again.